Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. They had ran this race and they got finished. They went to get something to drink. They came back and uh, they see something they'd never seen before. They see Jeff running and there's people behind him. And it was weird, you know, they, they began to go, what is going on? And Jeff, it's like something had come alive inside of him. Every muscle, you know, in his body is kind of working, trying to get to this finish line as this pack, you know, is moving up closely behind him. And, and they got him within like three feet from him and he finishes, he, he crosses the finish line and, and they jump over the fence. They're like, no way. And they run up, you know, to talk to Jeff and the, the, the you know, little guy comes over with a scorecard or record, you know, who got first, second. He's talking to Jeff and and Jeff's out of breath, but he's trying to explain. Uh, they hear him, you know, try to explain to this guy. Well, actually, I, I was still running from the last race. <laughs> now, you know, we've all had some things like that happen in our life, and it's embarrassing when it happens on the track field. But uh, I mean, it's tragic uh, when that happens in, in your Christian life, and, and especially in the ministry of the local church. It would be a tragedy for us to, to begin to lead, be the leaders of the church and, and get to the end of what we want to accomplish and find out that we had been successful at the wrong things. That we'd won, even in the Christian life, at the wrong finish line, the wrong race. And I love that this, this theme this week, as we passionately pursue the Gloria Dei and this the verse that captures that Jesus prays, Lord, I have brought you glory by finishing the task that you have given me. Not the task that he chose, but the task that God has given for him to finish. And you know, that's a theme throughout Scripture that God gives people tasks and he loves to see them finished. Adam, the job of naming the animals. Moses, the tabernacle, Solomon, like six times in Kings. You notice how it says Solomon finished the temple in all of its details, all of its specifications. Nehemiah finishes rebuilding the wall. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And the Apostle Paul says something very similar in Acts. He says, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me. The, the way that we bring God glory, we bring the glory of Dei uh, to, to our life and to the church is by finishing the task that He has given to the church. And so we want to make sure, especially as, as many of us are preparing to lead uh, the church in America and around the world, that, that we are preparing them to finish what God's task is, what His mission is, that we're, that we're going to win at the right race. And so this morning, what I want to do is we're going to look at three uh, realities that, that we need to be able to prepare the church for, and uh, really three realities that we need to educate the church on so that the church, as leaders uh, of the church, we can be involved in, in an educated way in the mission, the missio dei uh, of, of God. And, um, and this involves uh, every area of our ministry. And so this morning, I want us to just together get our hands around some of these concepts and ideas that you would be kind of the missions experts. You could have kind of an inside look at these missiology ideas and that we would all be these kind of missions nerds together when we leave. Can we do that? And we just want to look at these three realities and then we'll dismiss. One is just this, is that God's mission is about peoples, not just people. And this is probably one of the newer eras of mission uh, and philosophy of mission, but it's probably the most important that this mission that God is on is about people groups, peoples, not just as many people. And this will shape the way you d decide what, how to spend money on evangelism versus cross-cultural missions in every area of your ministry. I was in a class here, uh, a cultural context class, and one of the professors was talking about what, just, what makes these people groups different? What makes these uh, cultures different? And these are some of the slides he has. We kind of taught here in Texas. He said, only in Indonesia you know, would you see a market that looked like that. You could drive through on a train. Only in China would you go to the swimming pool, and uh, a few other people were there. Then only in India would you see that, because they believe in reincarnation, that many people are re reincarnated as rats. It's one of the gods of India. said only in Thailand would you see 
A pet like that. How would you like to have a pet like that, John? And then he says, you know, only in Texas did you see that. It's these worldviews. What makes us us uh, and them them? And, and we know that when Jesus gave the Great Commission and, and, and said, go make disciples of all these ethne, the ethnos, that he was, was talking about something way more specific than the nation states of the world. And, and if you read, you know, John Piper, Let the Nations Be Glad, he gives about 80 pages to this one Greek word because God is on this mission to reach peoples, these people groups, these clans, families, gen, the Gentiles. Uh, and well, let me just show you kind of how that looks in the world. This is uh, the country of Nigeria. Some of you may have been there. Uh, the political nation state. And I used to think, you know, if we parachute uh, some missionary into Nigeria and he begins to share the gospel and, and, and everybody starts to come to Christ and a massive you know, revival breaks out, I just thought, well, the gospel will naturally spread to all of Nigeria, maybe all of Africa. Just like a pancake. You know, you pour the syrup on and you see the syrup spread over the whole pancake, right? That's what I used to think, but that's, that won't necessarily happen because this is a good picture of what the 455 people groups in Nigeria look like. And so even though the gospel might be dropped into the Ebo people group, there's 16 million of them, they speak a different language than the people group next to them. They have a different culture, different customs, different religion. They don't associate with the other people groups around them. And so the gospel gets locked into one of these ethne unless someone crosses one of these cultural boundaries, learns a different language, learns a different culture to take the gospel into each of these people groups. And God has promised to bless through Abraham all peoples. Jesus has commanded us to go make disciples of all, just like we were reminded this morning in the email, the all of the Great Commission. And so the world's not a pancake, it's a waffle. It's a waffle. <laughs> We need to drop the syrup of the gospel into each of the people groups on the planet. You, you, know, you might wonder, man, how many, well, how many people groups are there? And uh, probably this, the best data is beginning to come together. The Southern Baptists and Wycliffe have begun to cooperate and put together a website, peoplegroups.org. And, and I even just looked last night. They just updated it this month to get the newest kind of numbers if you're into numbers. And uh, total, 11,363 people groups on the planet. And of those, there are still 6,494 that are considered unreached, less than 2% evangelical. But do you see why we would want to focus on finishing? This is about completion of the task that we need to begin to pioneer and focus and make priority toward these unreached people groups. Most of these 6,000 that are unreached are located here we talked about Tuesday, in this area known as the 1040 window, almost 88% of these unreached groups are located here. Are you tracking with me? That's why this area is a priority for the evangelical church. Because in order to complete this task, to bring God glory where His glory is not yet known, the church is going to have to begin to do, as Jesus said, I must preach the good news to the other cities also, for this is why I've sent. 2.4% of the missionaries are working here. There's great need. And there's a reason why this area is so unreached. And that's our second reality. The first one is God's mission is about peoples. The second one is simply that God's mission, it has obstacles. Within this area of the world, you find all of these other major world religions. And these major other worldviews. And if you want to make it very simple, don't worry about the 6,000 people groups, but there are basically five affinity blocks, five affinity groups that you can remember. And as we educate the church, I hope that this might you know, be something that you can just educate them around, these five major groups that represent almost this entire area. Easy way to remember it is just the thumb. It's kind of a cheesy acronym, all right? But we like that kind of stuff that preach, right? T-H-U-M-B. And the T stands for this group, tribal. 
the animistic religions of the world. Uh, D Doug Scheibel, you know, gave me a good definition the other day of New Tribes. He said, animism is just the manipulation of the spiritual realm in order to, for the purpose of receiving personal gain or safety. Have you ever seen the, that movie, The Village? Did you ever see that movie? That's a good picture of a tribal worldview, a tribal culture. There's about 250 million tribal people still in the world. The uh, end of the spear, the Aukens, the Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, those guys worked among, those are tribal people groups, mostly located in places like Papua New Guinea, Africa, parts of China. And, and when we start talking about the unreached, especially in the most remote places in the world, this is the question that immediately begins to come up, and, and it'll come up in your church all the time. What about those that never hear? You know, in my whole life, I have never heard a sermon preached on this topic. It's, a, it's, a, it's scary. And, and as we travel the U.S. in the last eight years, by the end of the semester, I've been to 49 of the 50 states in the last seven, eight years. And the pulse in America, as you probably know, is that there, it, within the church, there exists kind of this closet universalism. And I don't even think that they know that they're universalists until you begin to just ask this question. And they begin to kind of add up and do the logic themselves. Well, Jesus said He was the only way. And I, I didn't realize, but yes, I, I, I just kind of thought... I met a girl two weeks ago who said, I was taught. Not that she just could, you know, concluded, but she said, I was taught in the church that people who never heard about Christ automatically went to heaven. And I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you were taught that. And I, I have students come to me and say, well, Claude, what about creation? Doesn't the creation reveal God to the world? And I say, it does. You're, you're right. And that's, that's, part of the, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Romans 1 talks about that. And I'll just take them there. It says that for since the creation of the the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, invisible, you know, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood by what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Creation does exactly what God designed it to do. It functions to condemn people who are. And and, and by the way, people are not lost because they've never heard of Christ. We know that men are not born as blank slates. We are all descendants of our representative Adam, and thereby sinners conceived in sin or lost. But just as Dr. Bingham says, when, God, when people have a, a remedial knowledge of God, what do they do with it? They begin to suppress it. And suppression leads to exchange. Remember that from Dr. Bingham? Suppression leads to exchange. And when he said that, I thought, that is the tribal world. For they said, for all that they knew God, they neither glorified Him, gave Him thanks, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, reptiles. That's the tribal world. The H in the thumb would represent this group. Hinduism. Almost 950 million Hindus in the world, mostly located in India, uh, parts of Nepal. Very, and it just kind of at an outward glance, you would think they're polytheistic because of the millions of deities in India. But if you get to know kind of their worldview and theology or philosophy, they're more pantheistic. They believe in kind of a, a, pan, a one God who takes on many manifestations. And so the inclusivism and everything is, uh, is very difficult for the gospel. I have a friend that was working in India, and he met somebody and asked him, have you heard about Jesus? In fact, he sent me this picture. Uh, he, says, have, he asked the guy, have you heard about Jesus? And his response was, oh, yes, he's one of my favorite." And that's the, uh, that's the philosophy in Hinduism is that uh, we worship millions of gods. They might have a main god like Vishnu, Shiva, uh, Krishna, but they might also include hundreds of other deities from the culture. They might have a prayer closet that's set up. They believe in reincarnation, so they believe that the soul is reincarnated through these different animal systems. You re you, by, through karma, you might work your way up through the, the system. Uh, you know... There's a story in India of a man who spent his whole life adding up the gods in India. He went culture, culture to culture, city to city, caste to caste, just recording kind of a census of the deities, you know, of all the gods in India. And at the end of his life, when he was 93, he started counting. And the rumor, you know, the legend is there's 330 million, but he began to count. And at the end of the book, 
uh, at the end of his life, he wrote down the total number of gods worshipped in India, and he wrote one. He, with his dying breath, he declared, there is one God worshipped in India, and he takes on many different manifestations. And I, I talk to Christians all the time, and, and if you in dialogue with a Hindu, a Hindu would say to you, you know what, we worship many gods, one God, many manifestations, just like you Christians do. Just, and, just, and, and they'll say, just like you worship, man, God the Father in the Old Testament, who, who became God the Son in the Gospels, and who he was changed into God the Holy Spirit and, and now. And, and, and I'll say to churches, isn't, isn't that, they'll say that, and, and you know, people will nod, they'll go, Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's what we believe. I say, is that what you believe? And, the, and at most, they kind of stare at you with this blank stare because they're not sure. Is that the, that God took on different modes? <laughs> and they, they're unprepared. And I say, no, that's not what you believe. We believe that God eternally existed as the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then He does not take on incarnations in the way that Brahma did throughout history. And people, the reason why Muslims and Hindus don't understand the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is that so many of the Christians are unprepared and unequipped to explain the doctrine of the Trinity. And even as I teach missions, I've just committed to try to throw that out there that people would see how important it is to be Trinitarian. And I hope that you teach that among these many competing worldviews. They're going to engage your people that you lead. And we need to prepare them, just even with, as the Scripture prepares us, that man does not reincarnate of the soul, that man is destined to die once, and after that, face judgment. That's the T, the H. Now, the U is kind of tricky. It's a C for China, turns sideways, okay? <laughs> we got to kind of stretch that one a little bit, because we needed a vowel. But uh, the U also stands for unreligious. We know that most people in Asia are atheists because of communism's taught them. Religion's the opiate of the masses. And so for the most part, people in uh, Asia and China, are, they're non-Christian, they're, they're atheists. But the reason I'd rather say China is China's 1.3 billion people and growing. It's a massive amount of people. And if we're going to pray for anyone, let's just pray for China. And remember China. One out of every six people on the planet is, is from China. And even though the, the church is growing in China underground very rapidly, it's true, it still represents the 100 or 200 million believers in China still represent such a small fraction of that country. 1.3 billion is like, if we took everybody in South America, Africa, Europe, Canada, in, uh, and crammed them into America for the weekend, that's China. That's 1.3 billion. And so the, the, the harvest, like Jesus said, man, I think of this verse when I think of China, that the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. There's a story, you know, uh, you teach your kids about Marco Polo at the swimming pool there at Swiss. There's a legend about Marco Polo that he was a missionary, a friar to, to China, and the emperor was so impressed with Christianity that he said, you know, I want you to go back and I want you to send a hundred missionaries from Rome to teach my entire empire about Christianity. And he went back and over the next couple of years, he tried to recruit people to come with him. And out of, he didn't get a hundred, he only got two. And when those two got to the mountains, they turned back went back home. And a lot of people believe that maybe that's the way China is the way it is today because of the failure, the disobedience of some of those people. So the harvest is plentiful. Labors are still few. The M, as you can probably guess, is Islam or Muslims or Islam. Fastest growing religion mostly by birth rate, but the second fastest growing uh, religion mostly uh, by proclamation or, or proselytization, by evangelism. They have missionaries all over the world. There's more Muslim missionaries in the world than Mormon missionaries in the world. Most of them located in the Middle East, North Africa, Indonesia, the Stans. Europe is quickly becoming a very Arab Muslim area. Muhammad, 510 A.D., was disgusted with the polytheism there in Mecca. And he went and meditated, and the angel Gabriel is said to have appeared to him and, and began to give him revelation, which later became the Quran. He began to go back and preach against the idolatry there in Mecca, and they kicked him out. He returned a few years later with like 10,000 followers and took it by force. 
The five pillars of Islam is just the confession that there's no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. To pray five times a day. To give alms to the poor. Make a trip to Mecca once in your lifetime if you can afford it. And to fast during the month of Ramadan. It's a very simple religion. And it's among African Americans, it's probably the fastest growing, especially in America. It's surpassed Judaism, I just read, as the, uh, one of the larger religions in America. And, and my wife and I, we just got back from the Middle East in April. And uh, we got to visit some places. And I had some video I just want to show you. The, one of my favorite places that we went. If you want to work with Muslims, you're going to spend a lot of time here. A, a good Muslim might go here five times a day. Uh, there's one on every corner. I'm going to let you just guess what it is. Let's see if we got this video. Can you see that? There's one on every corner. They go there five times a day. It's my favorite place. And if you want to minister to Muslims, you might spend a lot of time here. <laughs> Starbucks. You know, they're incredibly wealthy. We were in UAE, and I realized that they don't listen to the, uh, the Christians that are from Indo India. They don't listen to the Christians that are from Malaysia or Egypt. But as an American, as a wealthy American, you actually can begin to engage the Emiratis, the Omanis, who are virtually unreached with the gospel. And all these Muslim guys do is hang out at Starbucks and check out girls all day long. And I think, you guys are tailor-made. College students are tailor-made. <laughs> to hang out in the Muslim world. Maybe not you guys, but Starbucks at least. Man, there's, there's great need. You know that there are more Muslims that come to Christ per missionary than any other group. Don't believe that the Muslim world is a hard field. It's actually the most fruitful. We just, it's just that we have thousands of missionaries in some of these other places, but per missionary in the Muslim world, there's incredible response to the true Jesus and the true gospel. Uh, you know, I think of the 1040 window and I tell Christians, if, if the church does not get engaged in reaching the world, the Muslims will, because this is their map. And I took this picture at a mosque in USC, and I don't read Arabic, but I know what that is. That's their plan, to evangelize the rest of the world, to submit to Allah. That's the T, the H, the U, the M. And Paul warned us about the Muslim uh, faith. He said this, even though we are an angel from heaven should preach another gospel to you, let him be eternally condemned. In other words, he knew these events would take place. He's, he wanted to prepare the church to interact with these other revelations, these other gospels that would appear. The B in the thumb stands for our final one, just Buddhism. 350 million Buddhists in the world, mostly located in Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Buddhism is more, it's not necessarily a religion. There's no God in Buddhism. It's more of a philosophy. They would teach you, you can purify yourself from suffering by following the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths that Siddhartha, the Buddha, you know, taught to his followers. It's probably the religion that's most influenced American culture. If we, if we look around, and, and, and that's one of the things that you'll need to be prepared to do is re prepare American Christians to engage with these other philosophies that begin to manipulate and begin to kind of influence their thinking. We, we, a lot of us grew up loving Star Wars, but I hope you know that's that's Buddhism that's behind that. I don't know if you've seen like some of the Coke commercials that come out that, you know, give a little love and it all comes back to you. Is that a Christian doctrine? No. We don't, Jesus didn't give love so that it would come back the circle of karma to Him. And so be careful. You need to be equipped and be able to equip others. And especially in, in our uh, generation, no matter where you pastor a church, no matter where you lead in, in, in this Christian ministry that you're headed into, you're going to lead people, mechanics, businessmen, teachers that work next to Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists. The world religions are not the study of the cross-cultural missionaries. It's not just for the CM students. You need to be prepared to engage the worldviews that are all around us, especially in America. Well, the third reality that I want to look at is just that God's mission has resources, plenty of resources. And so we just want to ask the question, where are they going? How, how's the distribution of, 
missionaries and laborers going. And I just want to show you kind of what the world looks like. I'm not trying to pick on any of these countries, but I just want to show you how the distribution of laborers has gone in the last 2,000 years. In India, there's one missionary for every 2 million people. In China, one missionary for every 700,000 people. I want you to begin to see the imbalance that exists. One missionary in Vietnam for every 3 million people, but one missionary in Mexico for every 2,000. One missionary in Peru for every 240. Argentina. If you flew over Argentina and threw out a rock, you'd probably hit a missionary as you're going by. <laughs> you just, you see the imbalance. And, and the point I'm trying to make is, is this, is this God's, uh, does this make God pleased? Does that make sense? Is God pleased with this? Do you think this is His intention? Because when we begin to talk about God calling, God calling me into this ministry, or God calling me to this church, or this country, or missions, what, what that subtly does, I think, is it begins to shift the blame from us to God for this situation, as if God is senile, as if God accidentally called someone else to Argentina and forgot all about Vietnam. God is not confused. The issue probably has to do with us. And so as we go to finish the task, we need to ask, man, what, what are, where are the distribution of money? What about money? Where does the money go? This is from Gordon Conwell. 99% of all money given goes to the reached areas of the world, like America, Canada, South America, a little bit of South America. Only 0.01% goes to the unreached people groups of the planet. If we look at all the missionaries, you think, well, man, there's missionaries out there I mean, there's missionaries that have went. This includes Catholic and Protestant. Out of the 430,000 missionaries total, do you know that only 2.4% are working among unreached peoples? It's not great. I, just, I, I thought it'd be a little more than that. And when we come to full-time Christian workers, like many of us will be, 4 million among the reached, 1 million among the unevangelized, but then 20,000. 20,000 for the task remaining. 20,000 where God's glory is not yet known. Where there are 2.4 billion people who he, have, he has created to bring Him worship. He's created to bring Him glory. And His glory and His worship is being given to other lesser things right now. As we pursue, as we passionately pursue the glory of God, it must be, we must give priority to those who are not yet within reach of the gospel, to give God glory and to be about finishing what He's given us to do. But can I just kind of give us some uh, in, insight into how Paul did that? He said, remember the scripture, I've made it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not known. I want to show you the context that's around that because we've we got to ask the question, well, Claude, what priority do we give America? Because there are needs here, right? There are lost people here, plenty of lost people. And Paul put it like this. He said, now, from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel. Do you think that means in that entire area? Here, I've got a map just to show us so we can remember. From you know, Jerusalem all the way almost to Italy. He says, I have fully proclaimed the gospel. Does that mean that every single individual in that area made a personal decision to make Jesus their Lord and Savior? You think that's what he means by fully proclaimed? You know what he says after this in this passage? He says, now there's no more place for me to work in any of these regions. I'm out of a job. I'm done. I'm moving on to Spain because I've fully proclaimed in this entire area. Do you ever wonder, man, was he, was, is that what he was saying? That every single individual trusted Christ. That's obviously not what he's saying. He's saying, I've planted a church in each of these ethne, each of these people groups. I've left behind a Timothy to disciple men and to evangelize, and I am pioneering. And he gave priority to finishing the task and the unreached. There's, there's a valid ministry in both places, okay? But the church, if we're going to lead the church, we need to help them be about finishing and pioneering. There is never, don't ever say that there's more need in America than among the nations. There is there, not mathematically, not financially, people, missionaries, Christian workers, materials. It doesn't add up. 
But the only thing there's more of in America is, I think, more resources. There's, there's potential. There's more training that we can unleash. God might want to use you to pastor a church in America, but to unleash hundreds and thousands of dollars and hundreds and thousands of missionaries to the, fin- to the finishing of the task. And that's a call. When we look at just what's available, I just thought, now what if we sent teams of 10 to each of these unreached people groups and take about 66,000 new missionaries? That's not that many. Take about 3 billion in annual support. Uh, it's a lot of money. But here's what's available. In the church, as far as people, there's 680 million evangelicals. That means 550 churches for every one of these unreached people groups. It would just take 449 churches Teach, you know, teaming up with Irving Bible to support and send out 10 people. I think that that's probably doable. It ends up being about one, at one Christian out of every 10,000 to actually go. And as far as finances, there's two, 5.4 trillion available in the evangelical church. It ends up being about $2. It's a, you know, a grande you know, mocha frappuccino with whipped cream per year per believer to finish it. There's more money embezzled by janitors than is given to missions. Just picking up change out of the pews Sunday morning. And I think, man, we can make a difference. The people in this room that can lead the church can make a massive difference by raising any of those things, even just a little bit. But don't be discouraged. The church, man, it's growing. God doesn't need the American church to finish the task. The church is growing worldwide at an incredible rate. Just look at some of these. There's more Christians in Africa than North America. In China, the total house church is 58 million. Look at Mongolia. Ten years ago, there were no believers. Today, there's 70,000 Christians. 50 churches. Nepal, in 1960, there's no church. And today, there's 400,000 believers. The church is growing. God is about finishing His task. And the American church has a critical role to play in serving and training the global church that's rising up. The, The church is growing worldwide, but it's young. You have training. They have zeal. And the American church has an incredible, incredible role that we might get to play in coming alongside as co laborers, not as leaders, but as co laborers in the one mission. Of God, You know, in 1960, there was this uh, Olympic runner, this guy from Tanzania, John Stevens, something, and uh, he was running the marathon, and right when he started, he fell down and he cut his leg open, and he had to stop and bandage it up with whatever he had, and then he kind of hobbled on and kept walking and eventually jogged, and, but, but at the end, when he got kind of close to the end, all these reporters had caught wind of the story of John Stevens from Tanzania, and they gathered around the end, you know, as he kept hobbling, came in two or three hours later than the other runners at the Olympics. But as he crossed uh, the finish line, they, they, they swarmed into him and they, with microphones, just asking John, John, what was going on in your mind? What kept you moving forward? And he just simply, I love it, he said, you know, t- my country... My country didn't send me to the Olympics to start the race. They sent me to finish it. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. We want to passionately pursue the glory of Dei by being about finishing His task. Man, may that happen. May that happen through some of you as you lead His church toward that. Let me pray for us. Father, pray that this information, God, would not just be, uh, we wouldn't just be uh, full heads but empty hearts, but God, would it translate into transformation? And would you raise up church leaders and mobilizers from this room to, to have a massive ripple effect on the world as we lead the church in being educated about your mission for your glory? And God, may it, be, may it all be done so that just as your word says, so that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth one day as the waters cover the sea. We pray those things in your son's name together. Amen.